Hi, kids. How you doing? Did you have a nice Christmas? Did you have a nice New Year? Did you miss me for two weeks? I had a great Christmas. I was in California. First time I've been out of the country for Christmas. Visiting my two little grandsons. And my son and daughter-in-law. It was fun. Lots and lots and lots and lots of fun. Are you ready to start another new year of Ask the Pastor? This is show number 118 on this wonderful one-hour format. And uh, we're going to open in prayer. And uh, I want us to pray for a good buddy of mine that, you know, and I, I, I don't have a lot of details, but um, uh, my my good buddy, Nick Vandergrack, who, of course, did the Nick and Knight show on CFRA, and him and his wife, Allison, they actually lived with us for eight or nine months when I think it was Allison was taking a course, and, and uh, you know, we've been up to their home, and, and Nick had a bad accident, and he's been, uh, um, seriously, I, I, I believe he's, he's still in intensive care, and I'm, you know, I've been waiting for news, and, and it happened about two, two weeks ago, and it's very serious, and uh, I want us to pray for him, okay, uh, that God would uh, heal him and, and bring him out of it, and, and uh you know, that peace and, and uh, harmony would be resurrected. I'm sure it's taking its toll on the family. And uh, uh, so we're going to pray for the show, and we're going to pray for our buddy Nick, okay, as well tonight. Father, thank you for uh, another new year. Another year closer to your coming. And, uh, Lord, I just uh, lift up Nick and Allison and the kids. And, and Lord, uh, you, Lord, nothing catches you by surprise. And Lord, anybody who tunes in, Lord, and, and, and sees this uh, uh, video of Ask the Pastor tonight, Lord God, uh, Lord, that they would join in prayer as well, Lord, that you would raise him up. You would heal his body. You would bring speedy recovery, Lord. Lord wherever he, whatever physical state he's in right now, Lord God, uh, um, um, strengthen him, God, and, and let your will and let your power be known in that family, God. Believe for that. Give us a great time. Uh, looking at your word and, and answering questions, and Lord, bring some great questions in tonight, Lord God, as the as the viewers uh, participate, Lord. And uh, the, when it's done, about an hour from now, Lord, I pray we'd all be able to confess and to really say with a whole heart, yeah, that's uh, God did something great tonight, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. How you doing, kids? Good to be back in the saddle. Are you ready to go? Do I have to remind you? That, um, you know, your uh, comments in the comment section, whatever you want to contribute to the show, be it a question or an observation of what we're talking about tonight, or if you want to introduce something new, um, your comments are always going to take precedence over what we've got prepared for the program tonight, okay? And uh, uh, so, spread the word. <laughs> Give us your thoughts on what John MacArthur quoted from a church slogan he found and talked about in one of his sermons. Okay, here was the slogan. If the Lord will allow you into his kingdom, then you're allowed to be a member of this church. Great. I don't know what John MacArthur said that uh, said um, about it, but that I like it. Makes sense to me. You know, um, um, yeah. Uh, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you're born again, um, yeah, that makes sense to me. Now, that there are some churches that, and I could see sense with this, too. I'm not going to, you know, I know how Christ churches run, and Christ churches run, that's the church that I pastor. It's run by the principles laid out uh, by the Four uh, Square Gospel Church of Canada, which you know, are as biblical as any other fellowship I know. Um, I know sometimes that, uh, you know, they that you cannot get into membership until your uh, uh, faith is proven, you know? And, and uh, uh, there's biblical precedence for that, okay? Like uh, James 2 talks about, you know, 
show me your faith by what you believe. I'll show you my faith by what I do. And uh, James clearly teaches that faith without works is dead. So I have no problem with a church that says, well, yeah, you say you're saved, but, you know, we'll be the judge of that. Now, before you go down that road of where you can't judge, yeah, you must judge. Okay? Uh, um, in fact, Jesus commanded us to not just judge by appearances. Okay? Um, when it says do not judge, it says that the Greek word for judge there does not just mean judge. It means you can't write off somebody and condemn them. And uh, uh, as far as judging is concerned, man, we exercise discernment and we make judgment calls all the time. And we better make right judgment calls. And Jesus teaches us that. And this is one of these areas where you've got to exercise judgment and discernment. And, uh, uh, you know, but as far as that slogan is concerned, I, don't, I have no problem with it. Um, I just think that that slogan is they're, they're opening them up, opening themselves. It depends on what your interpretation is of what God allows in his kingdom. The Lord saves by grace, okay? But sanctification is a lifelong thing. And, um, you know, I've known Christians who are saved by grace who cheat on their taxes. I know Christians who say they're saved by grace, and they've cheated on their spouses. Okay? <laughs> and these are people, well, you know, like uh, the whole time, you know, they're, pretending to be Christians, speaking in tongues, and the whole thing. And please, I'm not anti-tongues. I'm as pro-tongues as anybody. But, you know, <laughs> there are people that are, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And when you enter into the body of Christ, you got to realize that if somebody's even saved by grace, they're, we're all okay. We're one sin away from degradation, okay? And we are easily deceived, and the Bible teaches that. So I think that when a, a, a church puts some qualifications on membership like that, yeah, it's great you're saved, okay? So hang out with us and love with us and be part of our family for six months. And if you still want to be a member and you're ready to make that type of commitment, and membership is a lot like a marriage. I mean, you promise to be faithful and it's, it's a heavy thing, you know, and, and it's a, I think it's a good thing because it does it, it, it separates people from from just you know, kind of picking and choosing and do whatever they want to people who are mature enough to enter into accountability with other believers. And I think that's a good thing. That's a loaded question, Kirk, like most of yours are, and that's why I love them. Uh, let's see. Next one. Must a Christian believe every single word written in Scripture? What's wrong with picking and choosing? Well, we are not judged by our understanding of Scripture, thank God, or else not many of us would make it in, okay? Like, the, the Bible's pretty, it's pretty deep, okay? And there's parts of it that are just, man, scholars have been arguing over for not hundreds, thousands of years, and we're not judged by our understanding of Scripture, um, and, and after the blood and our salvation, we're judged, you know, what makes us saved and not saved. You know, the blood of Christ has been shed. We've accepted it. We realize that. We want it in our life. So uh, he saves those. Whoever calls on the Lord will be saved. Okay. We're judged, uh, according to what the word says, by our obedience to what we know, by the light that we have received. And um, I think that's fair. Um, Romans 1 talks about this, you know, like what can be seen by God is plain. So that even, you know, people that don't believe in them are without excuse, okay? And uh, every single word of Scripture, I have no problem. Let's look at it this way. I have no problem believing everything that's in Scripture. You know why? Because I know I'm not God. I know that Scripture comes from a source that is infinite in intelligence, infinite in its knowledge. So who am I to, 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 to you know, to, well, no, I don't believe that. If you Well, you know. I mean, I, I have no problem believing everything in Scripture. I do have a bit of a problem understanding everything in Scripture. But I think that's where the Scripture comes in. If you seek Him, you'll find Him. You know, ask for wisdom. He'll give it to you. I, I, um, thank God that God doesn't take an IQ test <laughs> to find out whether you're, you know, you're saved or not. Uh, having Christ in your life and, 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 and being on the, the right side is a matter of faith. It's not a matter of accomplishment. We believe what he has done for us, and we and we give ourselves to it, okay? Um, so I can accept everything that's in Scripture by faith. There's things in Scripture I disagree with. There are things in Scripture that make me scratch my head that you got to be kidding me. You expect me to believe this? Well, yeah, I'm going to believe it, but, you know, 
you and I got to have some talks, and we do. I talk about that those things to God all the time, and and my my uh, fellow believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we talk about difficulties in Scripture all the time. I think those are good, healthy conversations. But none of us are making the leap of, well, just because I can't understand it, I'm not going to believe. Well, you're an idiot if you take that position. Because that means that that all of reality and all of understanding is measured by you. I mean, it stands to reason that, you know, God, it's, it's unbelievable. There are some people who just have a tough time believing that God is smarter than they are. <laughs> well, I don't have that problem, okay? And I think anybody that really believes God and trusts Jesus is it, it doesn't think they're smarter than God. So I have no problem believing in Scripture. Understanding it, I'm working on that all the time. In fact, that's one of the reasons I love Ask the Pastor, because it, it forces me to you know, do a little digging and doing some more understanding about what is in the Bible. Because everything that we talk about on Ask the Pastor, my basis for uh, 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 my answers is always Scripture. Well, my if, if if my basis for all my answers is going to be scripture, that's always going to be uh, um, weakened by my own uh, ignorance as far as scripture is concerned, my own interpretation, my own take on it. So it behooves me to be more accurate to scripture and to be more objective. The more I know about it, the more understanding I have, and that's not a bad thing. Okay, I'm reminded of that scripture in Hosea four six where it says, "My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge." Okay. Don't believe this garbage that you have to turn off your brain to believe, okay? There are answers to every question you may have about the Scripture. I don't have them all, but they're out there, and they're there to be found, okay? Following Christ is an intellectual pursuit. It is is something that you come to the conclusion, this makes sense. I'm going to go for it. And it stands to reason more than any other, more than all other faiths combined, okay? And, um... It, you, you can, and if it's true, which makes sense, if it's true, it, it will stand up under scrutiny. You know, I have no problem, no problem with my doubts because uh, uh, you know the truth always comes out, and the Bible is is Jesus even said that he was in the embodiment of truth. He says, "I am the way." He says, "I am the truth." He's the measurement of all things. And and uh, again, another good loaded question. Good on you, Kirk. For those of you who don't know, who I'm referring to. Kirk uh, Tomerlin is the guy that supplies 99.5% of, of all the questions that you hear on Ask the Pastor. Uh, on occasion, we'll get one, you know, from us, somebody else. But Kirk is just, the guy's got a gift, man. And I think a real calling just to keep this uh, show afloat. And I couldn't do it without him. And uh, he, he's so good at what he does. Uh, if Jesus quoted and referred to the book of Genesis, wouldn't that be a good indicator that, ge- that uh, the Genesis account is true? Absolutely. <clears throat> and I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah. Um, now, Jesus uh, quotes from the book of Enoch. And uh, and the specific is when, when he's arguing with the Sadducees and he's uh, 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 telling them that there's no marriage in heaven. Okay. Well, the fact that there's no marriage in heaven, that is not, that's not in the Old Testament anywhere, but it's in the book of Enoch. He's literally quoting the book of Enoch when he says that. The theology that's in the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch is not considered to be scripture, and here you've got Jesus quoting from it. Um, so that would be the one argument I would have, and, and I'm going to read your question again so I got worded properly, Kirk. If Jesus quoted and referred to the book of Genesis, would that, wouldn't that be good enough indicator that the uh, Genesis account is true? No, because he did that with Enoch. And uh, the Jewish faith, the early church, and uh, and the, uh, none of them accepted the book of Enoch as uh, canonical as the word of God. Now, that doesn't mean it's not important. That doesn't mean it was not respected. I mean, it was a good enough book that Jesus himself, the son of God, verified its importance by quoting the theology that was in it. Okay? So there's a lot of nuances there. Okay? Like, uh, yeah, you know. And I, I'm sorry if I didn't answer the, the, the question directly, but I have to answer the question honestly. There's a, there's a number of factors involved in uh, uh, um, accepting a book and, and calling it canonical, the Word of God, just because Jesus quoted from it, because there are, the book of Enoch is an, is an exception there, okay? Is God, by nature, a Savior? Well, it seems so. From our perspective, I mean, if there was another God or if there was, you know, part of the ruling gods that are with him, you know, um, the ones that we're not supposed to have before him, you know, uh, the sons of God, which are not angels, they are part of that ruling council, according to, you know, uh, 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 Psalm 82 or 81, I can't remember which one it is, but, uh, and there's other scriptures where that, you know, that reveal that, Um, um yeah, I would say even by their perspective, he would be uh, uh, by nature a savior. 
Um, the number one attribute of God, and Scripture clearly teaches this, there are a number of attributes to God, holiness, uh, immutability, eternal, eternal nature, omniscience, omnipresence. Uh, um, the number one attribute of God is love, okay? And uh, the, the term Savior fits very nicely into how loving he is. If somebody who loves, saves. Somebody who loves, they will, if somebody is in need, they're going to save, okay? So yeah, he by, by nature, he is a Savior. If the gospel, if gospel means good news, then what is bad news called? Simple answer. I got to set this up. I'm going to read the question again so people get it and it get, gets branded in their brains, okay? Because it's an important question. If the gospel means good news, the word gospel, if gospel, the word, means good news, what is bad news called? Are you ready? Lies. Lies. Makes sense, doesn't it? The devil is the father of lies. When he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. Okay? Lies. Because what seems to be bad news, you know, if you are if you love Jesus and you follow Christ, everything's going to work out to the good. But lies are always, first of all, lying is a sin, and lies always taint the truth, which is pure. Okay? So bad news, lies. Okay? Now, I'm being simple, over simple, but I, I'm driving home a truth that I'm not going to apologize for. You know, if you go to, I think it's Philippians 4, 8, where's my Bible? Well, did I forget to bring my Bible in here? How could I do that? Do ask the pastor, you forget to bring your Bible in. How stupid is that? Um, uh, 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 the scripture in Philippians, I think it's Philippians 3, 8 or 4, 8. You'd find it if you went looking for it, okay? I, I haven't got my um, um Oh, there's my Bible right over there. Oh, watch the blank screen. Okay, just keep them uh, faith pledges coming in while the screen is blank. You know, we can't put this show on for nothing. You know, we got to keep giving. We never ask for money on this show. You know that I'm pulling your leg. Um, okay, Philippians. I want to. I want to look this up because, uh, uh, like I said, I have not. Um, I have not uh, memorized the entire Bible, but. Uh, uh, when it says, you know, think on these things, okay? Finally, brothers, Philippians 4.8. I had it right, just wasn't sure. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good repute, if there is any excellent excellence and if anything is praiseworthy, dwell on these things, okay? So something that doesn't fit into the category of Philippians 4.8, I would say that's bad news. I mean, you want to summarize, uh, summarize it in one word, it would be a lie, okay? But there's more to it than that. And I think that's a good judge of what's bad news. Anything that's not in Philippians 4.8 doesn't come under those categories. Kind of a longer answer than I wanted to give, but got to be honest. I would rather be honest and give you a complicated answer than give you something simple that isn't honest, you know, and isn't forthright and not going to be helpful. From Scripture, we learn our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But don't the Father and the Son also dwell within us? After all, well, yeah, there are. I mean, that's another mystery of the Trinity there, okay? Jesus did say in Matthew 28, 20, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yeah, through the Holy Spirit, because him and the Spirit are one. <laughs> that's one of those Trinity questions. I don't think anybody's ever going to get a handle on it because the Bible, the Bible uh, kind of teaches the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, but doesn't explain it. Why? Because it's a supernatural concept that finite men are never going to get their head around. Okay? Never. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're all one. How does that work? I don't know, but that's what the Bible says. So we try to, you know, have illustrations like an egg, you know, an egg's got a shell, and it's got a yolk, and it's got a white, you know. Or, you know, I've heard this one. This one's pretty good, too. Like, a, like a, take a, uh, any appliance, okay, like a stove. A stove. Well, the stove, you got the physical manifestation of the stove, which would be, you know, like the sun, the embodiment, the flesh. And the design and the planning and the, and the work that went into, you know, uh, having that stove, that would be the Father. And then the heat it produces and the work it does, that's the Holy Spirit. So the three are one, you know. None of those illustrations suffice, okay? Because, but when he says, you know, um, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, yeah, well, it, our bodies the temple through which the part of God that does the work. Holy Spirit does the work, okay? Works through us. And the Holy Spirit and the Father and Son are one. Deal with it. <laughs> That's a fun answer, eh? 
Why weren't Satan and his demon followers sent directly to hell instead of being set loose here on earth to steal, kill, and destroy? It sounds like mankind never had a fighting chance. Well, uh, the demons and the devil, they're serving the God's purpose right now. They are. They have been let loose, and they have a limited amount of power, and they only have as much power as God allows them to, to test mankind to determine who's going to make up God's eternal ruling family, the royal family that he's determining who's going to be part of that royal family. That test and that determination is going on right now through all of creation, okay? And, uh, you know, you can't test and you can't measure loyalty and love in those that you do love and you want to follow you, but you can't measure their loyalty and love unless their loyalty and love is tested. And that's how the devil and the demons serve the purposes of God. You know, and I know that sounds dark on the surface, but that's what it boils down to. Again, um, you know, and, and those of you that are listening, watching, you know, if, if uh, you know, there's a, a, a um, you know, there's a, a uh, something here that I'm not getting deep enough for you want to call me out to account to comment section right away type it in there I man that's that's when the discussion gets really fun when we start interacting some that, that way so avail yourself of that option okay uh, how does one prove himself to be a true disciple of Christ well um uh, to be truly in love with Christ um and a uh, the rest will take care of itself. If you really love somebody, you can't hide it. How do you prove to be a loving and faithful husband? You know what? Any faithful, loving husband that really, really, really loves his wife won't have to prove it at all. It's going to show in his actions. It's kind of like faith and deeds. If your faith is real, there's going to be deeds. If your love is real, it's going to be deeds. Okay? I can tell when somebody's in love. I can tell when somebody, you know, is not faking it. Okay? And uh, you know what? Other people can tell whether you love Christ or not. How do you spend your money? Who do you hang out with? How do you spend your 24 hours a day? I could tell whether you love Jesus. Let me see your checkbook. Tell you much love. Uh, I could tell you much love Jesus. When you're in love with somebody, boy, oh boy, that, there's there's no holds barred. There's no sacrifice too great. You're always wanting time. You always want to spend time with them. You think about them all the time. Okay, that's a very subjective thing. But if you take that subjective aspect out of your relationship with Christ, then all you've got is dead religion. Okay, showing up at church, you know, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, quote scripture, say the Hail Mary or whatever else, you know, whatever they tell you to do, you know, like pray when you're supposed to pray. It's all religious, meaningless garbage if you take the subjective out. Why do I emphasize the subjective more. Well, I find that the subjective is more lacking in the body of Christ than the objective is. Okay? Yeah, but what about charismaniacs? What about people who are so subjective, you know, they don't even obey scripture? Here's a good equation for you. And this is coming from a pastor's perspective, because we're responsible uh, to guide people. We're responsible to reveal Christ. We're responsible to make disciples. Okay? From a pastor's perspective, somebody who has been appointed a servant of the church or a leader of the church, Okay, it is way easier for us to steer a fanatic than it is to resurrect a corpse. Have you got that? Much easier for much easier to guide and direct somebody who is way too subjective in their faith than somebody who is so objective. You know, a million volts of the Holy Spirit going through them wouldn't you know bring any life. And remember, Jesus says, "I'm the way." I'm the truth, and I am the life. The word also says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's fun. Now, for those of you that might be tuning in for the first time, and that almost sounds blasphemous because you've always heard that the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Yeah, it means all those things. But the original Greek word is eleutheria. And if you do the research like I have on the word eleutheria, yes, it has the connotations of liberty. Yes, it has the connotations of freedom. But the word fun is far, 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 far more accurate to the original meaning of eleutheria than any other word we have in our language, okay? And I'm sorry, but I don't know a lot of people who have fun. You know, fun is not always an objective thing. Fun is almost always subjective. It's like when you tell a joke. It's not always funny to somebody. 
Okay, why? Because it's subjective. I know that's a multi-layered answer to a, 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 another great question, Kirk. Almost every question that Kirk uh, ans is asking here, and I think you should know this, you know, if you're tuning in and you're watching this later on in the week. We do this live, you know, 9 p.m. every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday night. I'm telling you, almost every question that Kirk asks, I would just love to have Kirk or have anybody live and, and us going back and forth and dialogue on it. It'd be 10 times as much fun. But right now, this is the technology that the Lord provides, and, and you know, we're thankful for it. But uh, uh, avail yourself of the comment section. Go for it. What promises are we given if we abide in Christ? That's in John 15. The main one, which is pretty big. In fact, it's so big, it probably cancels out any of the little ones. According to John 15, if you abide, it says, if, my, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you want and I will give it to you. That's a loaded thing. That's, man, that's a promise. I'm being silent because that's such an awesome promise that um, kind of makes me feel a little bit insecure. Because, boy, I, I, there's a lot of times I know that promise and I ask for all kinds of things. And maybe, you know, the and Scripture's got to be balanced with other Scripture. The best interpreter of Scripture is other Scripture. James 5 talks about, you know, you ask for something, but you don't get it because, you know, you, you got wrong motives. And that factors in there. That's a scriptural thing, you yeah? know? Well, you can't negate the promise, though. The promise is still there, made by the Son of God. Why is Christianity simple yet simultaneously complex? You know, it seems that the answer to that question is because uh, Scripture is uh, of supernatural origin. Okay? So if it's of supernatural origin, that supernatural origin knows how to be understood, knows how to, you know, communicate in a way that men will understand. But because it's of supernatural origin, his mind, his knowledge is so much more infinite, greater than ours. There, there stands to reason there's going to be things in Scripture that are complicated, multi-layered. You don't get it the first time around that you read it. In fact, if you're like most of us to follow Christ, you ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand. Okay? The Bible speaks of itself as the unsearchable riches of the Word of God. Unsearchable riches. And I know the Bible says, search me, search for me, and you'll find me. You know? He makes that promise. If you do search for me, you're going to find me. It's not an endless journey that you're, you're going to be lost. Okay? You'll never have it all together. That's impossible. There's only one person that can have it all together, and that's God but you'll have it more together than you did before you started. And that's a good promise. Not bad, not a bad deal. If we were capable of confessing every single sin we ever committed, wouldn't we have the power within ourselves to not commit the sins to begin with? Totally disagree. Are you kidding me? Just because you name your sin doesn't mean you can have the power over it. <laughs> never, never, never underestimate your own capacity to sin. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Other translations say that your heart is desperately wicked. Even if it's redeemed, even if you're ready to meet Christ, you still got this earthly flesh here, okay? And and just because you confess every sin doesn't mean you got to be, you got, we have no power. There's nothing, Paul says in Romans 7, there's no good thing that lives within us without Christ. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled into one of the, the foundational lies of the self-help movement that say, you know, like deep down inside, you're really a good person. You just got to get to the who the real person you are and you'll be fine. We're all, all men are naturally good, you know, given, you know, that's, you'd think they'd give their head a shake and realize the, the, the stupidity of that statement. All men are naturally good. Oh, really? Then why is it when you've got a kid who has no parental influence at all, by the, you know, and no discipline, uh, by the time they're eight, nine years old, they're burning the house down. <laughs> Why is it then that, you know, that, that, that what, 90% of violent criminals didn't have a father in their home? Why? You know, and God bless single moms, man, they're my heroes, okay? But kids need a father. And the father's usually one that brings the discipline and, and, and is not intimidated by the kid to confront the kid. Okay. 
Ivana, Rami. That's Rami and Ivana. They're married. So, you know, I got a, I got a comment. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is uh, uh, um, illustrated uh, most explicitly in Romans 1 and uh, not Romans, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, the book of Acts, Acts 1 and Acts 2. Acts 1, Jesus tells his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is uh, explicitly, uh, the best example of it is Acts 2, 1 to 4, where all these people are believers, they, they, they are the body of Christ, and but they've been instructed to not go and be the witnesses until God empowers them, and they are empowered with a subsequent blessing that is separate from salvation. It is an enabling, it is an empowering of the Holy Spirit. And uh, um, in, in the book of Acts, they spoke in tongues, and uh, these were actual languages that other people heard them speaking. Um, I've been in, in, in situations in church services where I've heard people speaking in languages they didn't even know they were speaking, and somebody who did speak that language were, you know, they'd, they'd never been trained, and they'd never learned the language, but there was somebody in the audience that picked up on it and, and realized that. Now, um, not every instance of speaking in tongues, and I'm talking about speaking in tongues because speaking in tongues accompanied the people. That seemed to be the, the, the most glaring sign that something had happened. And all throughout the book of Acts, you see when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they speak in tongues. And um, um, so that seems to be associated with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's an empowering. It's a subsequent uh, 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 ex subsequent experience aside from salvation. I, uh, one of the best illustrations I've ever heard of it is like uh, when you uh, when you get saved, when you give your life to Christ, he describes himself as living water. And that water, that spiritually, water goes in, cleanses, refreshes, gives life, okay? Where there's no water, there's any life. And so Jesus comes in like a glass of water and, and, and you, you are refreshed. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit. It's the same water, but you're not drinking anymore. You're floating in it. Okay, you are immersed in it. You're baptized in it. Okay, empowered by it. That is about as explicitly and as biblical as I can get in describing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, that's another question where man, we could, if there's more specifics, Remy, and you want to um, um, put them in the comment section there, and you want me to get more uh, explicit, feel free. Uh, I don't mind elaborating on that and on anything. Okay, that's what the comment section is there for. Okay. I mean, we mean for ask the pastor to be more than just be spouting off and answering questions. Hopefully there's dialogue taking place. And right now, the only way we could do that is with the comments. And so take advantage of it. Hmm. Where are we? Our spiritual attitudes, fruit that's produced as a result of abiding in Christ. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Let me read it again. Our spiritual attitudes fruit that's produced as a result of a body in Christ. I think they can be, because I'm thinking of the fruits of the Spirit, you know, faith, uh, um, um, long-suffering, patience. Yeah, they can be attitudes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say they're solely attitudes, but they can be. Yeah. An attitude change, that could be a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Are donations to nonprofit organizations a form of spiritual fruit? How about the edification of others? How about pure conduct and righteous behavior? Well, yeah, I agree, Kirk. Those are all of the above. I think all of them can be a form of spiritual fruit. What are you talking about, spiritual fruit? Like that's productivity. That's that's fruit. That's 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 you know something that's happened in somebody's life because Jesus is having their way. And look at the examples you just give me. Some people are gonna like uh, they're gonna give more money. Uh, some people are gonna, you know, they're gonna they're gonna be building other people up. There's gonna be edifying people more. You know, they used to not even care, but they go out of their way to you know to build people up. That's the edification of others. Uh, uh, conduct, righteous behavior. There's people that stop, you know, philandering, stop stealing, stop lying. You know, so yeah, that's all all of them, all of the above. Oh, more from Remy. Let's go. Should we? Or can we ask for signs like Gideon when making a decision? Oh, what a great question. Ivana or Rami, whichever one of you sent that, that's a far deeper question than you think it is. I'm going to give you my personal answer in my personal life first, okay? And I'm governed by the line where Jesus, you know, they're demanding a sign. If you're the son of God, give us a sign. And he says this. He says, a wicked and an adulterous generation 
asks for a sign. And none will be given you except the sign of Jonah and the whale, okay, where he's down in the whale for three days. And, and that's all he says to them. He kind of, he leaves them far more confused than before they ask the question. So I'm reading that and I'm going, okay, if I'm wanting to make a sign, does that make me adulterous? Does that make me wicked? And I think there's something to that. I think that, uh, uh, um, you know, if God's got to prove his faithfulness to you to a sign, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, you know? Um, why can't I just believe? Why can't I just do what he's called me to do? Why do I need a sign? You know, do I not trust him? Now, it's true that Gideon, you know, put out a sign, you know, God, show me, and, and God was merciful. I guess there's times when, you know, he does do that. But my own feeling, and, and, and I'm not saying this is theology. I'm not saying this is the, I'm giving you opinion here. I'm going to reserve the right to be wrong. And, you know, if anybody, anybody's got more comments they want to add to it or give me their take on it, I'd love to hear from them. My opinion outright is I think that having to have a sign is, you know, I think it's, I think it may be a, a signal of spiritual weakness, you know? And, and Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe, you know? The, 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 the sick will be made well, people will be raised from the dead, the blind shall see, okay? It says, these signs shall follow them the belief. He did not say the believers go after signs. It says the signs follow you. Should I be asking for one? Yeah, I'm always a little convicted, you know? Again, I'm not saying I'm any spiritual giant or anything, but I know what Jesus said about signs. Like, yeah, he was, he was gracious to Gideon, but... You know, I mean, Giddy was was tasked with something far more dangerous and far more faith challenging than I think I'll ever be faced with. You know, 120,000 Midianites, every one of them wants to kill you, and you're going to go in there and defeat them with 300 guys? Are you kidding? I'd be scared spitless. And maybe that's why God was gracious to him, because, you know, what he was asking him to do was, oh, it would have scared anybody half to death. So I think that's a good, honest discussion on signs, you know. If you want, okay, uh, Remy, um, if you go on, on the Facebook page, the Christchurch Facebook page, I posted uh, a sermon, I believe I did, okay, I can't remember. I posted a sermon on there by Vadi Bachman, and the title is, 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 is Praying Enough, or is Praying Scriptural? And he talks about this very thing here, about discerning the will of God. And boy, he comes down pretty hard against signs. And he eloquently and uses a lot more scripture than I'm using. Uh, you know, I would, I would, I would point you in that direction. And if I didn't post it, I'm pretty sure I did. You have to go back about a month or two. You have to go through all the stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff posted. Dave Kitts posted posts, uh, you know, his, his uh, pastoral stuff on there every day, and you know it's great. But because there's something posted every day, you may have to go back quite a bit. But Vadi Bachman. And a black guy with a beard, and, and if you can't find it on our website, it's worth going on YouTube. Type in Vadi Bachman, is prayer enough or is, is uh, uh, prayer uh, uh, always scriptural? You know, And the point he's making is, you know, we're praying for signs when, you know, God's already shown us what his will is to do. And it's, it was really good. It really helped me on that topic there. Much better than I think I'm helping you right now. Oh. Uh, Is there a correlation between patience and pride? Man, uh, I think there can be. Uh, depends on the person, I guess. Uh, the most prideful people usually don't have a clue how proud they really are until God reveals it, you know? Um, and, and patient people... You know, they don't really, I, I don't know, I'm not very patient, so it's hard for me to speak to it. <laughs> um, most patient people I know, I think they're patient. They don't think they're patient at all. It's a quality that, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to measure in yourself, but it's easier to see in somebody else. I can always tell when somebody's proud. Oh, man. Probably because I'm proud and I, <laughs> I don't like my own sin. So when I see it in somebody else, I don't like it at all, you know? I can tell when somebody's humble too. I think I can tell when somebody's humble better than they can. And, and uh, I like hanging out with people like that. I like surrounding myself with as many humble people as I can. Problem is there's not a lot of them around. So the ones I 
I found I, I stick to quite close. Oh, I love the interaction today. Can we? This is off the comment section with uh, Ramir again. Can we still get the baptism of the Holy Spirit today and not only the power of tongues? Um, you know what? If God's got a gift for me, if it comes with tongues, I want it. If it doesn't, I want it. I'm not seeking the gift. I'm seeking the giver. I think every Christian who's born again should be seeking God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How it manifests itself? Hey, look at If you're asking for a gift, you don't get specific on, unless you're an immature little kid. If you want a gift, you kind of drop pinch. You don't, well, it's got to be this way, and it's got to be that way, and it's got to be this way and that way. You know, I, yeah, it's a gift. So I seek the giver. I seek to be in a good relationship with the giver. And, and uh, um, you know, and Paul commanded it. He said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Ephesians, he said, you know, don't be filled with, uh, uh, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the the, the tense on that is be the, the literal translation is be continually filled. Be in a place where you you are continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't worry what the manifestations are. Just keep seeking, okay? I really believe, I think there's some people who are already in, in power of the Holy Spirit, and they don't even know it, okay? But that's not necessarily a bad thing. The bottom line is whether you know it or not, to be really filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and realize that's not just salvation. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray for it all the time. The first time I, th the first time I ever experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was 14 years old. I spoke in tongues for an hour and a half. I speak in tongues almost every day. I don't understand it, but it doesn't say I'm, I have to understand it. Because Paul said, I pray in the Spirit and with the understanding. Well, if you pray and with the understanding, what's praying in the Spirit? I guess that you don't understand it. Makes sense to me. And, um, boy, I've had long discussions on all of the implications of what I'm bringing up right now. And it takes a while for people to understand and to you know, kind of, you know, digest, but Man, if you can get over that, and usually the people that have the biggest problem with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, are people that have come from a theological persuasion that uh, preaches against it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of churches, and and, uh, and I don't want to name names, not tonight, some night I might, but that actually preach that it's not for today. Well, and I know the scriptures they use, and it's a really a, a not a very good interpretation, you know. Like 1 Corinthians 13, you know, tongues shall cease, knowledge shall cease. Well, knowledge hasn't ceased. Why should tongues cease? <laughs> you know, that's kind of dumb. Anyway, great question, Rarier. Really good. Does God have an autobiography? I'm sure it was a bestseller. Well, the closest you're going to get is the Bible. <laughs> Although there are authors who have actually written biographies of God, okay, but the only thing that could be autobiography would be, you know, like uh, the Bible, because it's, you know, inspired Ben to write it, but he is like the core author. The fact that you've got 40 different authors writing over a period of 1,600 years, and, you know, the harmony that it has, that's an absolute miracle. There's no way you can even get two authors to write on the same thing and agree. Well, you've got 40 of them over 1,600 years, and it's all, you can tell it's, you can tell it's a single author. And the personalities of the writers come through, and God, I mean, all scriptures, God breathed, men, holy men of God, moved by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the scripture. That's his autobiography, because he wrote it. Now, there are a lot of clever authors who have, you know, a biography of God, but those aren't autobiographies. A biography was somebody else writes your story. An autobiography is when you write your story. So the Bible is the closest thing you're going to get to an autobiography. Please explain Luke 23, 31. And this is what Luke 23, 31 says. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Okay, the context of that is, is uh, the women who are weeping for Jesus as he's going to Calvary, okay? And what he's really saying through that is, hey, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves from what is coming on the earth, Okay. And he's prophesying the persecution. He's prophesying, you know, that uh, 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 37 years later, Jerusalem was going to get sacked by Rome, and they were going to burn it to the ground and kill just about everybody within the city, okay? And uh, the phrase in question is basically him saying, you think it's bad now? It's going to get a lot worse. <laughs> 
In fact, there's there's scholars that will tell you that one of the reasons why Jesus said, you know, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and the other parts of the world, he was trying to warn the disciples, you know, you need to get out and spread the word because if you stay in Jerusalem, you're going to get killed. Get the job done in Jerusalem first and then go into all the world, okay? And that's what happened. <laughs> Anyway, good question, as always. Were written notices placed above everyone the Romans crucified, as in Luke 23, 38? Now, Luke 23, 38, it says that put a sign over Jesus' head that said, uh, this is uh, Jesus, King of the Jews. So Kirk wants to know, did they always put signs? Um, no, not always, but sometimes. Um, that notice was put over Jesus' head to taunt the Jews, okay? As And it was a way for Pilate and the Romans to, you know, really stick it into the Jews' cry. Hey, look it, we're in charge here. You're not. And if we feel like putting up over the a criminal's head that we're crucifying... And, and the, the Jews knew their own word that says "cursed is anything that you know that that hangs upon a tree." Um, you know, if we want to make, if we want to uh, declare that person king, there's nothing you could do about it. Okay, so that the main reason the Romans put that sign above Jesus' head was to taunt the Jews and to remind them of who's in charge. And I could see them doing that for other criminals, like, you know, like uh, putting a sign up to, this is what happens to anybody that, you know, that uh, doesn't obey a Roman centurion. This is what happens to anybody who goes against Rome. You know, I could see them doing that. That's the way they operated. They, uh, you know, they, they were pretty good at PR, you know, public relations. They're pretty good at uh, letting people know who's boss and, and uh, they could get quite creative. So it doesn't. The Bible doesn't say, and I don't think there's many historians that would say, you know, they did it anywhere all the time. But you can see why they would, and I know that's why they did it with Jesus, because the Jews came to Pilate and say, no, don't do that. We don't. We don't want to have him king of the Jews. He says, I ain't doing nothing. In other words, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm the I'm the authority here, and and you better remember it. Okay. Every account to Jesus's death is different, and therefore we don't know what his last words were. One account says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Another says, Jesus cried out, then died. A third says, it is finished. And the fourth account says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What were his last words? One of the above. Who was one of them? That going to make you sleep easier if you know which one? Because, you know, the there's a uh, um, um, there's another number of authors that have done this too, and it's it's not. I know that there are four different uh, accounts of of Christ's life. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. They're much more um, event orientated. They read like a like a storybook. And John, you know, gets into theology, into the heart of why Jesus said what he said. And there's been a number of very very successful attempts by different authors to take all the Gospels and to weave them into one, into a, uh, a narrative that goes by as it happened, having all the accounts of the Gospels put together. I remember um, oh, one of my favorite guys that did that, and I took his material and I taught uh, youth classes for over a year in, in the youth groups that I pastored. And the guy's name was Dawson McAllister. I don't even know if he's still alive, but Dawson McAllister... Uh, wrote a, a, a curriculum for young people called A Walk with Christ to the Cross. And then the sequel to that was A Walk with Christ to the Resurrection. And what he does, he takes all four books and he puts them together. So you have a complete narrative from every perspective. He did a beautiful job doing it. And I'm telling you that, uh, you know, uh, my kids and my youth groups, man, had a perspective on the cross and, and, and on the resurrection like nothing I've ever seen. I've never seen curriculum that was as good as his for doing that. And, and he's not the only guy to do that, you know. And I don't know what the term is. There's a term for taking, there's a theological term. I don't know what it is, but it's it's it, it's been done before. It's been, for 2,000 years, people have been doing it. Uh, taking the whole gospel narrative of all four perspectives and combining them into like a timeline that's specific. And you get a much more amplified, a much more 
uh, subtly nuanced, a much more explanatory uh, uh, version of of the gospel account. And to me, I think it's a good pursuit, you know. And I also think it's a good thing to have, you know, the different perspectives on it. I think it it, it tells the complete story that Jesus wants us to know. And um, um, I kid around about B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. There's a lot of stuff in scripture I wish was there. There's a lot of things I wish were explained more uh, explicitly. Uh, But I've come to the conclusion that God gives us what we need, gives us all that we need, you know, to grow and to be everything that we can be in our relationship with him and nothing more. And so I'm satisfied with that. And I got all of eternity to, you know, find out all the other stuff. I mean, that's, I think that's going to be one of the fun things about heaven. You're going to find out stuff that went on in the Bible and find out things that you never do. I think that first five or 10 years, that's all I think I want to do is sit at the feet of Jesus and have him, you know, do Q and A's. Can you imagine, can you imagine how cool that would be? You know, to be in a, in a room and, you know, he's, you know, he could pull this off because he's God. He can do anything, you know, you know, to sit in a room for about three or four hours with, you know, 20 or 30 people and do Q&A with Jesus. Go through the scriptures. Hey, you know, when you're on the cross, you're, you're like, those guys get in your nerves, you know. I mean, give us some of the lines that, you know, that, that were never in the Bible, you know, that maybe we weren't mature enough to handle it. That's why you didn't put them in the Bible. You know, we, we want to know. And, and, you know, what were you doing between the age 13 and 30? We all want to know. You know, did you go to India? Did you go to England? Like, you know, like so many, you know, legends and myths of, of thought. I, I think he's going to tell us that stuff. It's going to be fun. Luke twenty four eleven. Did the disciples discount the women's claim that Jesus had risen from the dead because of sexism? Were women at the time and in that culture considered untrustworthy? Why did the women's words seem like nonsense to disciples? Well, it wasn't sexism, okay? Um, because, I mean, you look at the, at the scripture, and even the Old Testament. I was reading the Old Testament a few weeks ago, and, uh, you know, when Deborah was a judge, and, uh, you know, there were female judges even before the kings took place in the Old Testament where they didn't distinguish between male or female at all. You had women that were just as authoritative as men. That was the Jewish culture. And, uh, uh, yeah, of course, Galatians, the cornerstone verse on this one, there's neither, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And uh, so it definitely wasn't sexism. Um, now, again, the, it was a very sexist culture back then. And it's possible that, you know, the disciples who were, you know, they weren't perfect and, and they could have had a, a dimmer view of the women. They certainly not would have, they certainly wouldn't have got that example from Christ. Okay. Christ was, I mean, you know, he was uh, probably the, well, no question, not probably. He was the, he was the greatest liberator of, uh, of women that any religious leader has ever been uh, before or since. And so it wasn't sexism. It was, uh, 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 probably more than anything, it was uh, they couldn't believe that he'd risen from the dead. It was hard for them to, there's no way, you know, because uh, uh, they didn't have uh, the last few chapters of the Gospels. They didn't have the book of Acts. They didn't have the, uh, like we have, you know, there, there wasn't a happy ending. As far as they were concerned, it was over. They had witnessed with their own eyes, their their best friend, their their leader, the guy that they had hoped and prayed would be the Messiah, they'd seen him have the crap beaten out of him, and they watched him bleed to death. And they were so afraid for their lives that uh, uh, 10 of the 11 that were still left uh, witnessed it from a distance, okay? And look at how Peter, who was Mr. Bold, you know, even denies Christ three times. They're scared to death, okay? And it remained that way until they heard news that he had risen from the dead. It was hard for them to believe, okay, because it was so gut-wrenching. And that's the main reason. When should we disobey the government? Uh, when it instructs you to go against what we know is right in Scripture. Okay? Um, the most glaring example is, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, well, there's a number of them. As I'm just sitting here, there's all kinds. You know, we're, uh, uh, the government, you know, you. I'll give you a good example. Pastor in Calgary, drag queens, Okay? Talking homosexuals, which the Bible calls reprobate, okay? Drag queens, you know, reading to little three and four-year-old kids in libraries. Calgary pastor shows up, 
and protest that. Okay? Now, he's disobeying the government there. That guy got thrown, that pastor got thrown into jail for protesting perversion. I think that is a perfect example of somebody who's disobeying the government because what the government is promoting goes right against Scripture there. And when, 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 when the government instructs people to go against what we know to be right in Scripture, okay, then it's time to disobey the government. Okay? I mean, all things being equal, you should honor those that are in power, okay? Because Romans teaches that. God has given them authority. But uh, sometimes I think God allows evil people, you know, to uh, uh, ascend to power because he uses them as a test to perfect believers. Okay? What are you going to do about it? You know, well, the government says for it's okay for me to kill my baby that's on, that I'm going to give birth to, okay? <laughs> In fact, they'll pay for it, you know? They'll take care of everything. And it's going to be a hard road if you choose to keep that baby. Well, there's something where you should go against what the government is saying, okay? Thank God for Corey Ten Boom, who went against the Nazi government and saved hundreds of Jews before she... Ended up going to a concentration camp. She was disobeying the government. Why? Because she knew that the government was literally killing Jews, going after Jews, and she knew that was wrong. That's when you disobey the government, when they are teaching things that go against Scripture. And I'd love to continue on with a conversation like that. Because that's got a lot of implications to it. And I've had those discussions before and always enjoyed them. Luke 24, 33. This verse tells us, the disciples got up, left Emmaus, and returned to Jerusalem. Weren't the city gates closed at night? The guards weren't going to open the gates to a couple of nobodies. How did they get into the city? Well, it would have been very easy to gain entrance at night, especially if they were residents of Jerusalem and known by the guards. They could have gone to Emmaus and said, look, we're going to be back at 9 o'clock. I know the gates are closed, but this is when we're coming back. But we don't know even if they came back at night. We don't know. It's not explicit, but it's possible they could have come back before the gates closed, or they could have, you know, let the guards know we're going to be coming back at this time, and they're citizens of Jerusalem so they can get in. Okay, they weren't nobodies. I think that's a, a, a that's a, a unnecessary assumption there. Ruth chapter four tells us Boaz married the Moabite woman Ruth and became the grandparents of King David. Wasn't this an unlawful marriage according to the law given through Moses? Uh, not for the women. Okay, she had no more rights or expectations because she was a widow, and and uh, remember she was uh, uh, she was married, I believe, to yeah, to a, a, a an Israelite before. So you know that for Boaz it was a different story. You know, there's no expectations on a widow of who a widow can marry, but for Boaz, you know, there might have been some expectations there, but he was considered a righteous man, and uh, you know, there's a good chance he probably had more than one wife which is crazy too, and I'm glad your question doesn't ask me about that. Then I'd have to go down that road and start explaining that again. <laughs> uh, one more. Exodus 28 and 11. Does the observance of the Sabbath promote public order? Absolutely. I think it does, yeah. One thing uh, the doctor of the Sabbath teaches, and, and that is the one commandment that, boy, Jesus was more lax on than any. And it seems to be as the one command, and he said it's not for God, it's for man. It's an opportunity, okay? If it's for man, it's an opportunity to, to, to kind of not let your job and not let your life rule you, but you rule your life. And uh, you know, take the time to stand back and just, you know, not do anything. Um, I think it promotes order. I do. I think I, I think that any society, and, and generally speaking, we've got a society that doesn't recognize it at all, and, uh, man, we are hell-bent that the most important thing is, is making money, making money, making money, making money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And one of the things that uh, practicing the Sabbath uh, uh, keeps under control and, and can come against powerfully is the love of money. Okay, you could be making money on the Sabbath, but no, you choose to honor God and you choose to trust him with your needs and... Those of us that do that, we've learned he blesses. He takes care. When you tithe, uh, tithing is a good uh, way to illustrate it. You know, he makes that 90% go way further than, you know, the 100% would be held on to it. I think the two are related. We're out of time. Tomorrow night, we're back at the Bible house. 
for a prayer meeting and Bible study, going through the book of First John. Thursday night soup night. I am cooking my world famous cabbage soup. Now I'm not bragging because I don't like it. It does nothing for me. But every time I cook it, people go through the roof. They think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. And uh, you know, our cooks that are normally on, okay, there's a bit of a mix up in the schedule. So whenever there's a mix up in the schedule and I gotta fill in, you know, it's time for Pastor Don to cook his cabbage soup. There's also a meat soup there. We always have two. We got a regular meat soup and then we got a we got some vegetarians, you know, they like the veggie soup and some people like to lose weight. I don't know what the. Anyway, when I'm called upon to do called upon to do my duty, I do my duty. So that's Thursday night and Sunday. We're back at Peace Tower Church, locked, cocked, and ready to rock to do what we call church. Um, drop by, come see us live. We'd love to hear from you. Let's pray, Father. Thank you for this opportunity, God, to talk about your word. Thank you, Lord God the venue you've given us, God. It's incredible. Not a lot of people tune in, but God, people tune in worldwide. And Lord, you have promised that your word will not return back to you empty. And we claim that promise for tonight's broadcast and for every Ask the Pastor program we do on Christ Church's Facebook page, God. Lord, every time, Lord God, we talk about your word, God, and proclaim it, God, you will do great things with it. You've promised to do that. Bless everybody that's connected with it, God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a good night. See you Bible study tomorrow night, 315 Lisker. And on Sunday, we're at 343 Bronson. Have a good night.